Hey, folks. Hey, this is uh, Big Anklevich here. And Rish, we wanted to... We recorded this a little while ago, and uh, since we recorded it, Neil Armstrong, who we speak about in the episode, has passed away. This was before it happened that we recorded it in the first place, so we thought it would be a good idea to dedicate this episode to the memory of Neil Armstrong and the accomplishments that he made. It seems pretty fitting when you hear the story in the conversation. Yeah, I would think so. So, this one's for you, Neil. Oh, Rish. I didn't fart. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 134. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. And we are old. Oh, my colostomy bag just broke. Oh, the horror. I'm lucky my sense of smell has receded. <laughs> All right. This is Rish, as I said. And Big. Welcome to the show. And uh, we have a story today. That's right. Uh, but actually, first we have a special guest. And now here's... What is this? Rish, uh, as you know, uh, we occasionally have celebrity guests on our show. and to uh, the- No, we don't. Yeah, we had Soundwave that one time, and another time was, uh, was was there another time? Well, I think we had Bria Burton on the show once. You wish. But just let me finish. We've got a special guest with us tonight, fresh off the biggest hit of the summer. Oh, wow. Is it that little black girl from Beasts of the Southern Wild? Rish, don't be insensitive. I'm sorry, that average-sized black girl from Beasts of the Southern Wild. No, just close your mouth and let me introduce our guest. Shutting up, sir. You know him from the pages of Marvel Comics, a couple of recent feature films, a 70s TV show which gave us our sad musical theme, and of course, The Avengers. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for The Incredible Hulk. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Really? You know, I would think you'd get all sorts of more attractive offers than Big's Kitchen. Not really, no. Your house nice, Banklovich. Sorry about your toilet. Wait, uh, my toilet? What? So, Hulk, uh, thanks for coming. Now, you've, you've had quite a summer. A lot of people say you were the best thing about Avengers. Hulk say that too. Was that surprising to you, the response to your character? No. Hulk always know Hulk is awesome. <laughs> okay... What, you not think Hulk is awesome, little man? No, I've loved Hulk, or uh, you, since I was a little boy. I mean, I used to get pieces of styrofoam and pretend I was Hulk smashing. That cute. Hulk used to do that, too. With styrofoam? With steel girders and boulders and stuff. SUVs and frat boys sometimes. Many Marvel fans felt your appearance in the Avengers was the most accurate depiction of you so far. Uh, They never get Hulk's nose right. No, I mean the closest to how you've appeared in the comics. Oh, yes, Hulk thinks so too. And a great deal of the credit has been laid at the feet of one man. Joe Schumacher? No, he only designed Hawkeye costume. No, I I think he's referring to writer and director Mr. Joseph Hill Tiberius Whedon. Puny Joss Whedon, bah. Everybody always talk about Whedon as though he's so great. Well, he did create Firefly. No make Hulk angry. Joss Whedon only build on hard work of many filmmakers, understand pacing, and treat characters with respect. What's so special about that? Well, there was the dialogue. And a better Loki than in Thor. And something for everybody to do. And he did get a good performance out of Scarlett Johansson. And the Galaga joke? Yes, Joss Whedon's second coming of Christo. He everything George Lucas not. He fart Febreze, blah, blah. Seriously? Do you not like Whedon? Did you have problems on the set? Ah, he always tell me what to do. Well, he was the director. No one direct Hulk. Only Hulk worthy to tell Hulk what to do. Jeez, you sound like Shatner. Okay, maybe movie turn out good, 
but it no Rambo 4. That movie make Hulk laugh. Me too, Hulk. Me too. So, what about other movies this summer? Uh, what have you enjoyed? Me like movie where teddy bear smoke pot and talk about anal penetration. Ah, that was Ted. Yes, Ice Age 4. Uh, how about Spider-Man? Hulk no like Spider-Man. He's smart mouth, jump around, CG never look right. D- did you see Brave? Hulk bravest of all. Well, yeah, but did you see that movie? No, Hulk disturbed by red hair in trailer. Wow, so was I. We've got a lot in common. Yes, outfield Hulk's long lost son. Puny, complaining, thin, fat boy. Uh, how about Dark Knight Rises? Yes, Hulk see that one. Go to IMAX screen. Enjoy football scene. A lot of people were saying that would give Avengers a run for its money. Dark Knight no beat Avengers. Avengers number one. Joss Whedon f***ing genius. But really? You don't think Christopher Nolan is better? Nolan make Hulk's head hurt. No like to think when go to movie. You must like the Transformers films then. Those make Hulk's head hurt too. Motion sickness. No tell robots apart. Megan Fox speak with accent in third movie. People uh, who like both films said that while Batman was technically better, Avengers was more fun, uh, more enjoyable to see again and again. Batman, Batman, Hulk sick of Batman talk. People always say Batman best hero there is. Puny Batman not beat Hulk in fight. Probably not. But what people say is that Batman is such a smart fighter that he can see his enemy's weakness and exploit it. Hulk no have weakness. But see, Batman studies his opponent and makes provisions for how to defeat them. It doesn't mean he's as strong as one of the other heroes, but he can find a way to win in a fight. Hulk no subscribe to this. You don't think that a smart, weak opponent can beat a dumb, strong one? You call Hulk dumb now? Not at all. I think I saw a comic once where you wore glasses. Yes, their brief time in 90s where Hulk and Sylvester Stallone wear glasses to make self look smart. It foolhardy attempt and convince no one. Well, actually, I'm pretty impressed with your conversation skills. You know, in the movies, they don't give you much to say. And I don't think the Lou Ferrigno you ever spoke. Uh, Hulk have difficulty memorize dialogue. Me prefer Marlon Brando approach. That makes sense, actually. Hulk tired of talking now. Okay, uh, I have just a couple more questions for you. Hulk say Hulk tired. No make Hulk angry. Thank you. When Hulk tired, other guys sometimes come out. Hulk no like other guy. Well, I like the other guy. Uh, did you prefer Edward Norton or Mark uh, Rob- You playing game with Hulk? Hey, look at the time. Thanks for joining us today, Incredible Hulk. No problem. Call me Incredible. Uh, maybe you could come back again sometime. Give us some details about Avengers 2? Hulk not have problem with that. Need to replace toilet and bathroom anyway. Wow, that's nice of you. Thanks. Yes, Hulk nice. Hulk and Tom Hanks. Hulk, go now. Okay, well, thanks for coming, Hulk. Did you arrange that? Actually, it was 08 OT. <laughs> well, it was a disaster. <laughs> You notice how he changed my compliment when I heard that? <laughs> Do we have a story today or can we say our goodbyes? Please donate to the show and have a good... We got a story, yeah. Oh. The story you'll be excited to hear because it's a repeat offender on our show. Bassist Michael Anthony is back. Oh, from Van Halen. That's right. Formerly of Van Halen, now performing with the band known as Chicken Foot. See, the last time you told me that, I thought it was a joke, but it, it's not a joke. <laughs> it's not. This really is it, the bassist from Van Halen that oh, sent us this oh, story. Oh, that's, no, it's... That's it's, awesome. Uh, now, I, uh, I that's wish... That's actually a joke, yeah. The sad truth is that bassist Michael Anthony really does perform for Chicken Foot. That's really the name of band, and he really has sunk that low. 
but not low enough to submit a story to the Dune Studio. <laughs> well, of course not. No one sinks that low. No, actually, uh, Michael Anthony is well. What what, what do, would I know him from? What story previous? And did he did he play on Divers Down? Uh, Diver Down? No, he was. <laughs> had to rub it in that was his twin brother michael anthony um oh so this was the 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 brat packer that was the, the always the nerd in the john hughes movies like the breakfast club weird science uh, no no National that's Le- anthony michael hall good good oh it's close but also not the one yeah you would know him from his previous appearance in episode 29 a better teleportation theory no no, I think it was the John Hughes movies. I believe the character of Ducky and the character of Cameron were both written for him. And re- he, ref- nope, dang, you're right. And Anthony Michael Hall again. Yeah. How do I have those crossed in my head? <sighs> I have no idea. That's just weird. About the author. Michael Anthony lives in Santa Rosa, California, and works in the healthcare field. He writes in his spare time, and his stories have appeared in Desolate Places, Arkham Tales, Dark Distortions, and Afterburn Sci-Fi, and has been podcast on Pseudopod, and right here on the Doonstief in episode 29, A Better Teleportation Theory. All right, and today's story was produced by a first-timer for us, Anthony Michael Lowe, everybody. (laughs) Close. Amory Lowe is uh, the producer on today's episode. He asked specifically to be able to produce something from the Broken Mirror story event, which is still coming up. And I said, sure, you can do that. And then he realized, I think, just how long it was going to take for that to finally come around. And so he offered to do a story before then. And so uh, we turned this one over to him, and I think he did a pretty good job. And you all can find out because we're going to start the story now. I'm not ready. Remember Mars by Michael Anthony. I don't remember what I ate for breakfast, but I remember every detail of our trip to Mars. Abraham said, grinning, that was a golden age in America. Children sat in a semicircle around the old man, their wide eyes studying him. We hiked along the rim of Vallis Marineris, the largest canyon in the solar system. I collected rock samples. Abraham cupped his hand and shook it up and down. I held a clump of rock in my hand, billions of years old. It looked like orange clay. The children listened in silence, as if any sound might break the magic of his storytelling. Abraham leaned forward and whispered, Did you know that on Mars you weigh less than half of what you do here on Earth? A girl with pigtails blurted out, Really? Abraham nodded. And you don't really walk, you sort of bounce across the surface. He wiggled his fingers, moving his hand through the air as he spoke. It's a magical place. The pigtailed girl gazed up at him, her chin resting in her palm. And you know what else? Abraham threw his arms in the air. It's cold. On Mars, you need a suit to stay warm. The girl jumped up. I want to go. Let's go. Another child, smacking gum, scoffed. Nobody goes there, stupid. He's lying. Abraham smiled at the boy. He shook his fist like he was rolling dice, then fanned out his fingers. An old coin with an eagle on the face appeared in his hand. Some of the children gasped. (gasps) Abraham tapped his temple. Imagination is like magic. With it, we can go anywhere or do anything. That's just a dumb trick, the gum-chewing boy said. You're lying about Mars. The girl with pigtails squealed. He is not. Luli Chang, distracted from her e-reader, strolled over. What's all the fuss about? She put her hand on the back of Abraham's wheelchair. Are you telling tall tales again, Abe? Of course not. It's all true. Luli rubbed his shoulder. Abe likes to tease, she said to the children. Everybody knows the Americans never went to Mars. Those landings were a mock-up during the space race. The girl with pigtails cocked her head. 
What's a mock-up? It means they played a trick on everybody. The gum-chewing boy smirked. See, I told you he was lying. He's not. A cacophony of small voices filled the room. Abraham reclined, his face beaming. Luli clapped her hands. Hush! She patted the air in a downward motion and whispered. Abe appreciates your visits, but others are sleeping in their rooms. We must remember to keep our voices low. She glanced at her watch. And now it's time to get back to school. The children groaned. They zipped into their cold suits, and a teacher's aide began leading them outside. A shuttle waited near the door. The girl with pigtails smiled at Abraham as she shuffled by. He winked and flipped the coin into the air. Her eyes widened, and she caught it, grinning. After the children left, Luli wheeled Abraham back to his room. Two beds with metal rails on the side sat horizontal to a single square window. Diego, Abraham's roommate, lay in the bed closest to the door, snoring. Luli touched Diego's arm, and he turned his head toward her, his eyelids struggling to open. Hello, sexy, he said, his voice raspy. Want to give an old man a good time? You couldn't keep up with me, honey. A boy in yellow scrubs pushed a food cart into the room. Lunchtime, Luli said, removing two bowls and placing them in front of the old man. Abraham grimaced. He pulled a deck of cards out of his shirt and shuffled them. What's wrong now, Abe? Luli said. Diego likes it. I'm tired of rice mush. This is barbecued pork flavor. I thought you'd like that. I ate enough baby food when I was an astronaut. Bring me a hot dog. Luli rolled her eyes. Don't be difficult, honey. You can't swallow solid food anymore. Hell, I'd like a hot dog too, Diego said. He rubbed his bald head with a wrinkled hand. Doesn't anybody remember real American food? I'm sick of noodles and rice. Now you got Diego all riled up, Luli said. You two calm down and eat your lunch. When I get back, I'd better see it all gone. She smoothed out a crease in her uniform and sashayed out. Diego fidgeted with his teeth and they fell onto his tray. He mumbled something. Abraham glanced up over his cards. What? I can't understand you. Diego groped at the dentures and mashed them into his mouth. I said I'd give him my eyesight for a pepperoni pizza. That's not a bargain. You're half blind already. They chuckled. Abraham practiced a card trick while Diego ate. Luli strolled in later. You didn't finish your food, she said to Abraham. I'm not hungry. You need the calories, Abe. You don't want to be too fed. Remember the last time? Abraham grinned. Want to see my latest trick? He found out his cards. Pick one. Not another trick, honey. The only magic I want to see is you making your food disappear. I say a man's appetite is the first to go, Abraham said, tossing his cards down. I wanted to talk to you about final arrangements. Abe, I don't have time. I want to be buried. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Just shove my carcass in the ground. Luli sighed. You know we can't do that. She massaged his neck. This talk isn't good for you. You've got many years left. I don't want my body stuck in an oven, Abraham continued. My wife was buried the old-fashioned way, and so were all my relatives. We were Catholic. There are too many people now. If we buried the dead, there wouldn't be room for the living. Because of my service, I was supposed to be interred in Arlington. Fine. I'll see what I can do. Luli said. Now don't worry yourself about this anymore. Nurse's orders. Abraham forced a smile and scooped up his cards. Luli turned her attention to Diego. He snored, his chin bobbing against his bib. Luli nudged him, and he jerked awake. What? He said, glancing around. Who's there? Luli folded her arms. Where did you get that? Huh? Get what? Luli snatched a flag out of a vase on his nightstand. This. The inspector is coming this week. Do you want us to all get in trouble? I earned my stripes in the war. I have the right to display all glory. You lost the war, she said, frowning. Look, I'll let you have it back after the inspection. 
Tell them I need a new wheelchair, Abraham said. She cut her eyes at him. <laughs> oh, sure. They'll get right on that. Right after they upgrade me to level one housing. When I was an astronaut, I was always... When I was an astronaut? She mimicked. Abraham lowered his eyes. You were never an astronaut, Abe. She said, sighing. The only mission you had to Mars was in your mind. We get tired of hearing about it. If Abe wants to believe he went to Mars... Diego whispered. Let him. Luli groaned. No, <laughs> you guys are going to get me in trouble. She paced out of the room with the crumpled flag in her fist. Abraham woke early the next day, put on his finest clothes, and scooted into his wheelchair. He then remembered it was Saturday. The children didn't come on the weekends. He rolled over to the insulated window and squinted into the morning sunshine. Spiked green turf covered the ground with patches of imitation flowers along the wall. A pseudo-tree loomed just outside. Abraham remembered real trees. They used to be everywhere. The sun bathed the plastic yard decorations in furnace-like heat, and the filter on the window gave everything a fuzzy orange glow. The color reminded him of Mars. But it wasn't hot on Mars. He stopped mid-sentence, realizing he spoke the thought out loud. He glanced back at Diego. His old friend continued to snore, his mouth agape. Abraham gazed back outside. He studied the fake tree with its umbrella of green plastic leaves. His wife was buried under a tall, leafy oak. He had picked the spot out for her. A comfortable spot to sleep forever, he thought, under the shade of a tree. A metallic clank echoed into the room, like a large valve shutting off. Abraham swiveled his wheelchair and examined the ceiling. A string of yarn hung stagnant from the air duct. It usually fluttered like a banner in the simulated breeze. The ding, ding, ding of an alarm sounded. Diego twitched awake, gripping the sides of his bed. What the hell? Ah, the climate control went out again, Abraham said. Oh, we're gonna die! Nah, we'll be fine. They always get it fixed. Diego's hands began to shake. The thumbs curled into his fists. What if the power went out? What if... Relax. You'll hyperventilate. Diego tried to nod, his face contorted. Oh, but it's hot already, he complained. Every year it gets worse. I know. The alarm went silent. They heard shouts on, and the shuffling of staff running down the hall, people. their shoes making clippity-clop horse trots over the tile. Luli stopped by their door, hesitated, and hustled off. They waited. Abraham pulled off his shirt. It was soaked with sweat. He wiped his face with the back of his arm and noticed Diego struggling to get his pants off. Keep them on, Abraham said, flashing a watered-down smile. I'm overheated. Do you want to make me vomit, too? Diego ignored him and wiggled his pants down to his ankles. He leaned over and tried to lift his legs. Luli scurried in. She wore a cold suit and held two bottles of electrolyte H2O. Drink this, she said as she handed them each one. Diego tore off the cap and gulped down the liquid. <clears throat> Abraham sipped his. Bad luck today, she said. The power grid for the city overloaded, and our backup generator has been rerouted to the greenhouses. She clenched her jaw. Idiots downtown didn't bother warning us. Cold suit? Abraham asked. Cutbacks. We don't have enough for everybody, she said. We're triaging what we have, the neediest patients getting them first. She patted Diego's arm. You're on the list. She gazed back to Abraham. I'm sorry, Abe. I'd give you mine if they'd let me. Abraham raised his hands and smiled. I can hack it. I went through worse in basic training. We once spent two weeks in Death Valley, and you... Get in bed and don't move around. Drink your water. She hugged him. I'll be back to check on you. They said we'd have power back soon, so don't worry. Abraham mock saluted. Luli lifted Diego, sliding him into his wheelchair. We need to get that suit on you. Diego brushed his hand over Abraham's knee as Luli wheeled him by. Good luck, buddy, he said. Abraham nodded and waited. Waves of heat marched into the room like an invisible army. Abraham's lungs burned with each inhale. 
He gazed out the window, trying to keep his mind focused. Would he ever see the kids again? He liked telling them about his trip. When he was gone, nobody would be left alive who had been to Mars. He closed his eyes and remembered the landing, the first steps on alien soil, and of course the planting of the flag. His head lolled against his shoulder, and he traveled even farther back. Flashes filled his mind like an old movie reel of him playing football with his friends outside during summer vacation, when summer was still a good thing. And the beach, the cool breezes and cold ocean waves. He remembered picnics and ants and ice cream. He remembered... He woke up. How long had he been out? Hours? It was hotter now, and breathing took more effort. He licked his lips and felt cracks in them. His tongue felt dry and numb. Where was Luli? He tried to call out, but there was no sound. He felt his head nodding forward, his eyelids creeping shut, and he chomped on his lip. If he went to sleep again, he wouldn't wake up. He fumbled for his water and drank. The precious liquid seemed to sweat out of him as fast as he put it in. In this heat, he knew he wouldn't last long. But I won't leave without a fight, he whispered, his voice cracking. Mars will protect me. He clutched the wheels on his chair, the rubber around them mostly worn to the metal, and rolled up against the closet door. Sweat dribbled into his eyes, stinging, and he wiped it away. He slid the closet door open and squinted into the darkness. An old cow leather bowling bag sat tucked into the corner, covered with an afghan his wife had knitted. The bag was a gift from her, too, ages ago. Cows only existed in climate-controlled zoos now. The nurses who admitted him hadn't realized the bag's value, and they were too busy to look inside. What was inside was priceless. He turned. He tried to push the chair into the closet, but it was wedged into the opening, the right wheel catching on the wall. He unfastened his safety belt, and the latch caught on his colostomy bag. It ripped open, seeping foul-smelling liquid. Oh, sorry, Luli, he croaked. He pushed himself up, his hands trembling and clutching the handles on the chair. His left arm wavered, and he fell forward into the closet. There was a snap as he hit the floor, and he felt a stab in his side. He rubbed his stomach, feeling ribs poking against the skin. The medic on Mars could patch that up. The tile burned like ceramic fire. He held the wall, pulling his torso further in. His old muscles flexed and stretched with the effort. This would make a good geriatric obstacle course, he thought, and smirked. He pushed further in and felt another crack in his belly. Luli was right. He should have taken his calcium pills. The bag sat in the corner, still out of reach. He wormed toward it. Closer now. He wiggled in further. The cracked ribs bobbed with the effort, and the pain shot through his spine, and he almost lost consciousness. He lowered his head, allowing the blood to return. Too close to give up now. He scooted in more, wedging his knee against the wall and using it as leverage. The effort caused one of the broken ribs to stab into his lung. He groped for the bag, clutching the handle in his fist, and cradled it like a baby as he rolled into a sitting posture. Made it. Made it. He stared down at the treasure, almost afraid to look inside and find it empty. The leather was cracked in places and worn near the handle from years of bowling. Those were good times. He smiled and unzipped it. The black sheen of a visor reflected his haggard image. He studied it, remembering when the helmet had been issued to him, and then carefully maneuvered it out. He traced his fingers over the material, recognizing every scratch and dent. The blue picture of the solar system stamped on the side was faded. With his forefinger, he outlined the letters on the tip of the visor. They were worn from age, and one letter was completely scratched off. It read, ASA. He elevated the helmet, like a king lifting his crown, and fitted it over his head. The foam inside muffled the sounds of the world, and the visor gave everything an orange tint. He no longer felt the heat. The pain in his side vanished. He wasn't thirsty. He closed his eyes and remembered better times. He remembered Mars. The inspector, a short man with a pointed nose and calloused hands, folded his arms and frowned. He surveyed the room, the empty wheelchair, the brown liquid mess that seeped from the closet, and 
shook his head like a parent disapproving of a naughty child. He glanced up at the vent. A string fluttered in the cool air. Luli stood behind him, her head lowered and her hands clasped together. The man pushed his glasses up on the ridge of his nose. Where is he? Beg your pardon. I don't know, sir. I'm responsible. I should have checked on him. He couldn't have left the room on his own. The inspector kneeled, glanced under the beds, then stood and straightened his uniform. Check the closet. I'm not going near that mess. Luli scurried over to the wheelchair and pushed it away. She squeezed into the closet, pushing through the clothes and ducking inside. An empty helmet sat in the corner. She picked it up and carried it out. I found this. She said, the helmet balanced in her hands. It's wet inside. I think he was wearing it. It looks like an astronaut's helmet. The inspector waved his hand in dismissal. <clears throat> a child's costume. She tapped her fingers on the surface. I don't think so, sir. None of us believed him, but he did say he went to Mars. Nonsense. The senile babblings of an old man. The Americans never went to Mars. His eyes narrowed, and he snatched the helmet out of her hands. Now get this mess cleaned up. But, sir... The man smiled, and his voice softened. You've done a good job here, Luli. I'm going to recommend you be assigned to Level 1 housing. She lowered her eyes. Thank you, sir. We'll search the building for the body, but you won't mention this to anyone. I understand, sir. Good. He strode out, the helmet tucked under his arm. Luli strolled over to Abraham's bed and sat down. His deck of cards lay strewn across the blanket. She picked up the Queen of Spades, rotated it in her hand, and noticed dirt had gotten under her fingernails. She thought she had cleaned it all off. Good thing the inspector hadn't noticed. The sun began to rise, radiating like a giant ember. The rays filtered through the window and cast strips of carrot light on the wall. The tint reminded her of pictures she had seen of Mars. She leaned back and imagined what it had been like for Abraham on the Red Planet. She remembered all the stories he had told, stories she would now tell the children. She also wondered if anyone would notice the mound in the yard under the tree. And now, a word about today's story. The inspiration for this story probably came from when I worked as a CNA in a convalescent hospital in Santa Rosa, California. One day, a new patient was admitted, and he would tell me stories about how he used to play football for the 49ers. The guy was in his 80s, and he would have been on the team around when the NFL was first created. None of us believed him, as it was common for patients to come up with tall tales, and this particular hospital was not exactly top shelf in the world of health care. So anyway, one day one of his children came in with a box of his personal items, which included pictures of him standing next to various famous 49ers, such as Joe Montana and Jerry Rice. Apparently, the 49ers have dinners every once in a while where former alumni can mingle with current players, and my patient had been to a bunch of them and had collected a lot of these photographs from over the years. Like Abraham in the story, other than being confined to a wheelchair, he was in very good shape, and like Abraham, he would also complain about the bland diet they had him on. I would have gotten in big trouble for this, but I'd sneak him in a candy bar every once in a while. The backdrop of the story is standard dystopia, and that's probably because I'm a pessimist. But I think it ends with a theme of hope and shared human experience. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Hope you liked the story. I did, or we wouldn't have taken it. That's good. Do you have an... Not an author's note. What's the other thing? Oh, the after the story comes the feedback. <laughs> we have, we have no feedback on the story. Maybe oh, okay. We'll, good night, everybody. Maybe we'll do some feedback later on when we uh, talk about the story. But to begin with, we'll go ahead and start the cast list. That's right. I don't know who I was thinking of there. Cast list. Now let me bring it up. That's what she said. All right. On this one, the narrator and Abraham was played by Rish Outfield. Lou Lee was played by Kim Price. Diego, Go Diego Go, was played by Big Enklevich. And the inspector was played by Amory Lowe. And the children? Have you checked 
the children. Yeah, the kids were my kids. It's funny because we decided to make it easy on ourselves and just use uh, my daughter, who is the one that can act well, as the boy. I don't think she appreciated <laughs> being cast as the boy, though. We kept telling her, no, 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 make your voice a little bit deeper. And then later, Amory went in and lowered the pitch on her voice a little bit more so that she sounded like a real boy. So there, there's a stigma attached to that? Because growing up, yes, for the boy to play the girl would be humiliating and torturous, much like our podcast. But for a girl to play a boy? Yeah, I think it works either way. Although it kind of depends. Like if the girl is already a tomboy or something, she might think that was cool. So yeah, my youngest daughter, who actually is a tomboy, but she played the girl. She might have thought it was cool to be the boy. Sorry. It's the way it goes. But it was a pretty good, uh, well done show. I really enjoyed Emery did a good job with it. And this was the first he had produced for us? It's the first he produced for us. Yes, I believe at one point he had a podcast and I'm going to find out what it is real fast. But we know him from voice work then, right? Yes, he's been a voice in a couple of different things for us. And uh, he's also been one of our submissions readers in the past as well. So he's not brand new to the show per se, but this is his first producing gig. Oh, you know, I just realized how I remember Emery Lowe. When I die, he gets my rancor high interceptor and vintage Gamorrean guard figure. What so. the hell? I was going to get the Rancor. Sorry. Well, it, actually, it's the expanded universe Rancor with like the purple stripes on it. So you wouldn't. Oh, that. oh, OK. Yeah, you can give that to Amory. Jeez, you started to say that and I was thinking I needed to do a range an accident for you so I could get a hold of that. Anyway, sorry. Uh, back to the subject. Amory Lowe did have a podcast back in the day. It was called The Great Beyond Podcast. That sounds familiar. I think I've actually listened to the Great Beyond Beyond yeah. podcast. How long ago did it exist? Uh, it's been quite a while, I believe. But I think it was defunct before our show even started. Oh, um, that's too bad. The, the corpse of it was still laying around iTunes for a while, so I was able to download and listen to a bunch of the stories from it. But uh, but no more. But it was already done putting out episodes before I ever heard his first episode. Um, interestingly, though, you could... Can't now because like it doesn't come up on iTunes anymore. But you could hear a Michael Stone story on that podcast. It was an interesting deal his podcast because I remember he made it. He he started it way back when doing stories on podcasts was really uncommon. And I remember seeing him say, you know, Escape Pod does science fiction stories of this certain length. But I noticed that there is a unfilled niche which is stories of a longer length. And so he would do like novellas and novelettes. Wow, that's longer. ambitious, man. Yeah, I know. That's probably why it's defunct. <laughs> I think he spread them out over several episodes. But yeah, he would do longer stories. It's too bad that he couldn't keep it going. But, you know, you know how it is. I mean, we barely kept it going as long as we have. So I can totally understand, especially if you're doing novellas and novelettes, one to cut it off early on. You, too, can help the Dune Steve not go defunct by <laughs> contributing. We'll give you this tote bag for every... No, by being a producer. Oh, just there like, you go. Just like Amory Lowe. Right. No, if, if we had more producers, we would have more episodes. But if you're listening to this right now... This is a voice from the grave. <laughs> no, if you're listening to this right now, it's because we've had so many people step up and produce stories... Like, you know, I produced last week's and we've got somebody producing this week's and they've made it so that we're almost a regular show again. Yeah. And so if you'd like to help us with that, I, I don't know, you don't have to go all out and do an extensive sound effects riddled musical extravaganza. If you'd like to do that, that's great, too. Just let us know at editor at doonsteef.com if you would like to be a producer. And uh, I don't think we'll turn you away, will we? We certainly won't. Today's story was interesting. I don't know, it's one of those those kind of topics that always gets to me, always excites me a little. I don't, it's one of those things that people always say, oh yeah, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a fireman. And then I wanted to be an astronaut. And then I want, you know, it, it seems like astronaut is always one of those things that kids dream of. I don't know that they still do. Yeah, I wonder if that is the case anymore. Well, we live in an interesting time because... And, and you and I were just talking about it today. 
a lot of the things that people used to imagine and dream about, and wouldn't it be great if, are just at our fingertips yeah, right now. Yeah, they're real. And they're they're banal, and they're everyday, and they're ordinary. They're the kind of things that you'd be like, here, one-year-old baby, play with this to uh, keep yourself occupied. Sure, it cost me $300. But- and it has more technology than got us to the moon and back in it. But yeah, just play with this. Bang it on your face and onto the ground a few times to keep yourself interested. You know, the things that science fiction authors imagined would happen a thousand years in the future when people no longer even spoke to one another with their mouths are already passe, are already, oh, geez, that's so 2004. But the one thing that has stopped is just the whole idea of expanding our reach, human reach of of going into space and exploring yeah. Strange new world. And, and, and it, <laughs> the space race has, has finished. It's it's over. The, Nothing is over. The winner was declared and uh, the race is done. Everybody's turned in their little bonnets that have the... Is that what they call those? I think they call them bonnets. The little numbers that you wear. They really call those bonnets? I want to say that's what they're called. I'm going to check wow, that out. I, and, and I thought you were a man for <laughs> running. I was wrong. Get wrong. Nothing. Bib, that's it. They've turned in their bibs that, uh, you know, they, they wear. They've gotten their final times and, and they've handed out any of the prizes and all that. It's it's just like done. There There's no space race, really. That's one thing that I thought was kind of funny in this story. You know, they're like, oh, Americans never went to Mars. That was just a sham they put on during the space race. Uh, I assume what they're really talking about is a second space race that between existed between China, yeah. China and uh, the U.S. When you were a kid, did you ever dream of being an astronaut? Was that something you wanted to be, or did you just dream of being like a Starfleet officer? I don't know. I think they were sort of one and the same. Uh huh. You just the, dreamed the of idea being a roguish captain of a ragtag <laughs> ship that can do the Kessel Run and. Less than, Less 12, than parsecs? twelve parsecs. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, there has to be a ton of people that got into astronomy or the space program because of science fiction, because of Star Trek or Star Wars or Buck Rogers or Barbarella. But you know, we grew up just too late. I will. I guess I'll never know what that was like in '69 when we landed on the moon, or. Yeah, um, I was going to say, you'll never know what it's like to 69. <laughs> <laughs> All we have really are, you know, the recollection of others and documentaries. Mm-hmm. But the idea that it was old hat so fast and that people, you know, lost interest that quickly is sort of baffling, but it's also human nature. Mm-hmm. We lived through the space shuttle program from the beginning to the end. And there was a bit of melancholy like this story when that the space shuttle landed for the last time right that's something that i really responded to in this story is there is a sense of melancholy from the beginning to the end Definitely. and it has a happy ending and i didn't make air quotes but it with my voice i made air quotes it is a happy ending in that he got to be buried you know i, I just it, <sighs> you got to fight the man one last time and there are different kinds of happy endings, and and someone would some might say that this was a sad ending, but there can be both. Yeah. And, and I thought so. what I liked about this story is that there was a sadness, but also a positive feel to the story. Mm-hmm. The idea that we stopped the space race because we had won, or because more likely there was no money in it, yeah, there was nothing think- to be gained, or whatever, is so cynical and so typical but it would be so great to feel that again and to be excited about it and optimistic about it again yeah yeah. i think if you were an astronaut and you were to tell somebody hey i'm an astronaut pretty much anyone heard that would be pretty impressed it would be as good as telling them you were a brain surgeon or something like that really as far as that goes it's still one of those things that holds weight although i mean that kind of holds weight for other sad lost and fallen professions like there are times where i tell people that i work in news and they're all like whoa you work in news that must be awesome and it's like, <laughs> like you must get paid a fortune I'm like, oh, oh, oh. 
But you're talking as though you're describing, I'm a Pony Express writer. <laughs> is the news becoming more and more of a lost art or a I mean, is that, is that the comparison you're making? No, no. I, I'm just talking about the opinion that people have of people that work in that industry versus the reality of it. I mean, it's, it's changing a little with astronauts. I mean, people are already seeing astronauts that, you know, put on adult diapers and drive across the country to try and murder the other astronaut <laughs> just because she was going out with the other astronaut kind of a thing. And, you know, the name astronaut, you know, uh, for your profession doesn't necessarily carry... The uh, huge, you know, at one point, you were a friggin' rock star if you were an astronaut. I mean, you could walk out on the stage with Mick Jagger and get half as many uh, more women swooning over you. I mean, well, you know, Neil Armstrong probably hasn't bought a drink in 40 years. Seriously, even Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> well, he got a fucking Disney character named after him. There so you that's, go. that's awesome. I mean, that. Well, I was going to say that's better, but <laughs> it's better than drinks being bought for you, I would imagine. Those guys, I mean, the, the, they made a whole movie just about the process of them going into space. You know, the right stuff. It was a huge book, a huge movie. It was a huge deal, despite the fact that it was super long and pretty boring. Maybe it's just because I was a kid when I saw it and it wasn't made for kids. I don't know. Apollo 13. I thought that was a pretty well done movie and not hugely boring. And it kind of touched on the stuff that we're talking about where people were already like, oh, can't believe how dull these moon landings are. Who cares? And then all of a sudden, oh, these people are going to die. Oh, now I'm interested. It's weird how things have changed. And yeah, like we were saying uh, when we were hanging out earlier today in our pre-game meal, at our training table, we were talking about uh, people have phones in their hands and, and they're like that old quote that you hear in science fiction where they say, you know, technology that's advanced enough is indistinguishable from magic. I mean, some of these things that these phones can do are just, it's magic. It's like having the oracle in your hand or something like that. The stuff that it can do, it's like having R2-D2, except for you can understand him. It's just amazing stuff that these things can do. We've got all this magic at our fingertips. How much do we care about going to space anymore? What what can it gain us? And a lot of people are just like, screw that. You have to pay taxes to put these guys into space. And it's it's not getting us anywhere. And Well, if China suddenly ramped up their space program like it was when Sputnik went up and America felt, would America feel threatened in the way that we did in the Sputnik era? I don't know if we would because it's not a imminent possibility of war kind of a thing that it always was with the Soviet Union. You were afraid to be behind them in anything because that could give them the advantage. And, you know, there's, oh, they got satellites over our heads. Pull your robe in closer to make sure they can't see down your shirt with that thing or something. I don't know. It's if people were just nervous about that kind of thing and they'd get that advantage. But I don't think that the same kind of relationship exists, at least right now, between China and the United States. You know, there's rivalry and stuff like that and you know they're kind of the other superpower when it comes down to it and when the olympics are on well heck we better get more medals than the chinese because they're the second best but but there's not that sense of it was almost a sense of desperation right of worry of who's on top but it's a shame i wish something could be done the funny thing is though china actually does have a pretty extensive space program they're working on putting their own space station in orbit and it's supposed to be ready by 2020 and they're already doing that and they're planning crewed expeditions to the moon and to mars maybe there will be a space race if they actually really go for it i don't know it seems like every time i want to say early years of george w bush's presidency they were like oh yeah we need to really get going on putting another expedition to the moon and then going to mars afterwards and then a few years later, they're like, no, no, we're going to end the space shuttle and we're going to stop doing all that stuff. And eh, maybe we'll consider a, a, a different way into space. So now we've got no more space shuttles. Now, wouldn't it be much cheaper now than it was in the 60s? Just with polymers, with communication, with the, the advances in propulsion and, and all that stuff. 
or I, I suppose inflation hits everything. I don't know. It's, it's just, it, it boggles the mind that we haven't gone back in our lifetime. It is kind of weird. You know, at the time, science fiction books were coming out all the time and they were always about, you know, oh, there's the, the moon base. There was no conception of the fact that we would just be done, that we would go to the moon and then we'd never go back. We wouldn't establish a permanent place there and have people there all the time and be moving on and having places, you know, a base on Mars, et cetera, et cetera. It's weird, definitely, that that didn't happen. Everybody just expected it. It was just like, yeah, of course. Yeah, the moon base. Yeah, they're playing that moon game from Enter Sandman out there. And yeah, it's really big because you can play in moon gravity instead of Earth gravity. So much better. But <laughs> that stuff just never happened. It ended when the competition kind of went away, I think, is really what happened. Well, there, there's something sad about that. And to think that we do have the technology and that we could have been on Mars years and years ago if people cared. Okay, let's say that we land on Mars, that human beings land on Mars, whether it's China or America. Would that not galvanize people and make people excited and make people wonder and look up at the sky and say, there it is, there, there's somebody right there right now. The way that 1969, the summer of 69, did to our parents' generation? I would think so. I would think that would be a huge deal. It could possibly happen, I think. You know, it's one of those things where they keep saying you know, we may do. I don't know. You know, the other thing that has kind of happened in the last 20 years is a lot of the space stuff is kind of transferring from government to private sector development. You know, we, we've got the virgin space liner or whatever they call it i don't remember what they call it but virgin is trying to put together a ship that takes people up into space and you won't have to pay 20 million dollars or whatever it was that lance bass paid you'll be able to pay uh, quite a lot less because they'll be doing trips into space all the time and shoot man i would pay as much as i could manage to be able to have a chance to go into space, even if it was just to be up there just long enough to be weightless for a little bit and then come back down. Well, see, that just answered my question because that is a money-making venture. Yeah. Right there is a dollar sign attached to it. And if we've become so cynical and so jaded and so small that everything has to have a dollar sign, then there you are. There, That's it. That's your potential for riches is people who are much more well-off than you, right. feeling the exact same way that you feel. I don't know. My niece and I go out right before school starts every year and just have a day where we do some, We go to an amusement park. And she was asking me, the two things that she was asking me questions about were us landing on the moon and Hitler. <laughs> okay. And, and, you know, I happen to be an expert on one of those topics, you know, which <sighs> we focused on more. But I, I was trying to explain to her the apathy that fell across people after we had gone to the moon. And it was like you were reading a Bible story about the Pharaoh hardening his heart against Moses. Be like, oh, come on. These, these miracles just happened and this just happened. And he turned a rod into a, a serpent and, and, and all this stuff. And then the Pharaoh hardens his heart and he says he won't let the Israelites go again. It sounded like a fairy story where you're like, well, no, I'm, I left something important out of the story. I can't remember what it was. Just, just a second. It, it wasn't logical. It wasn't logical that people immediately after would be like, all right, eh. Yeah, we did that. So let's see what's in the TV guide. You know, it's just like, <laughs> but that's what happened. And when the space shuttle first launched, it was just a giant deal. And we experienced that apathy again right after that. You know, the next launch got lots less coverage. And by the time the Challenger blew in 86, nobody was watching anymore. No, it was just a fluke that cameras happened to be running that day. <laughs> and I guess that just says something about the human condition. That's something sad. But dang, we've never stepped foot on another planet. Yet we could. Yeah, I think that things are still progressing, though, just in a different way and definitely much less covered, less coverage for the things that are going I, I mean, I saw a story on the news once about a spaceport they're building in New Mexico. 
you will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. Yeah, it's just out in the middle of nowhere. Apparently, it used to be, well, maybe it wasn't an airport. Used to be a Denny's, yes. Used to be a Denny's. <laughs> Not much and difference. They expanded it just a little bit, put in a couple extra wings. And yeah, it's Spaceport America, it's called. It's in uh, the, I don't know how to pronounce it, Jornada del Muerto Desert Basin in uh, New Mexico. It, it says they've launched eight suborbital missions since it opened in 2009. So maybe that's where you have to go to catch the Virgin spaceship or something like that. But yeah, I guess it's supposedly made for launching into space. This is the spaceport. You go to the airport and then you go to the spaceport if you're going to go and land on Ceres. Ceres. <laughs> it's an asteroid. <laughs> Well, well, can you tell me a little bit about Curiosity? Curiosity killed the cat. Well, here, here. It's about time. <laughs> it's about bloody time. That's an interesting thing because, like you were talking about, the excitement. Have you ever seen something that's had more excitement about it as far as Again, space goes? Just, not in a while, but it was, it was just up. smart people that cared. <laughs> Yeah, you'd see a lot of that kind of stuff. Like on Facebook, people would put up those pictures. There's like, this is while you guys science. were fighting over stupid medals in the Olympics, we landed on Mars. <laughs> Sincerely, science. It's something that's gotten way more excitement than other things have. I'm not quite sure why. I mean, we've landed other rovers on Mars. Maybe it's just the size of it or the difficulty of getting it to actually work out. It may be that we live in a time... Where people need something like that. They need to think that there's hope, that there are still possibilities out there, that there's still untapped avenues to pursue. Could be, because I had no idea that it was even happening until like the day that it landed. You know, all of a sudden news stories about, oh, yes, this is a one in a million chance for this thing to land okay. And uh, it's going to be eight minutes of fear, followed by hopefully some rejoicing. And then you see all the NASA guys standing there and they're like, whoa! super excited when it actually starts transmitting and it wasn't just crushed to bits from then on it was just you see things on facebook where curiosity is using its laser to kill a cat on mars and and oh gosh they grow those cats big there yes they do you see you know shots of curiosity and random internet memes put in to the shots like michaela maroney she's not impressed with the uh, landing of curiosity on mars all that kind of stuff, but it's there. It's uh, Apparently, it's the size of an SUV, which is much larger than other uh, rovers that had made it to Mars. I don't know, maybe someday we'll have a base on Mars, and uh, the Curiosity will have run out of battery and drawn to a halt, and there'll be like a little museum built around it. Come see the Curiosity Museum, and you can go and see where Curiosity finally ground to a halt, and they refurbished it and buffed it up and made it look shiny again and it's like going to the kennedy space center or something except for it would be it would be like i don't know going to plymouth rock or somewhere like that where people first landed in the uh, new world or whatever that'll be interesting and i'll never see it happen <laughs> no wait i'll have uploaded my brain you live on as a computer that's right that crashes almost as much as you do in your car now <laughs> I don't know. You know, we, we, we didn't talk a great deal about the story, but I guess we are sort of talking about the story. The conspiracy theory, I think we have talked about that. Uh, my uncle is a non-believer. He thinks that we didn't really land on the moon. And, and he, I remember him when I was a kid saying, oh, I can even tell you where it is out there in the Nevada desert where they did the mock-up and you know, she's like, oh, my gosh, is this true, Mom? And he's like, no, no, you know, he was adopted. You can't <laughs> trust anything that he says. Uh -huh. But no, he, he used to tell me that. And I wonder now, not whether we landed on the moon or not, but whether he actually believed that we didn't land on the moon or was just feeding me a, a story to see how, what my reaction would be. But gosh, the idea that no one would believe, no one would remember that it had just fallen into myth that this poor man was a Buzz Aldrin or a Neil Armstrong. And who's the third guy? There was a third who's guy? Who's the poor bastard who had to stay back in the... Michael Collins. The third guy, Michael Collins, which we actually had to look up. Don't think I'm smart. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure they don't. But <laughs> that 
people would not believe these guys that they were celebrities because you would have had to have been and gone from that to the agency disavows any knowledge of your existence. Uh, that's horrible. I don't know. That, that, that stuff always bothered me. And it, whenever you see a movie where there's a, a superhero or something and he's done these things in secret and the people around him don't know that it was him. And he's like, oh, I, I sure wish I had Spider-Man here. I'd give him an upside down kiss the world has never seen before. And he's like, God, why can't I say something? All right. Uh, off topic. Sorry. Yeah. You talk. But it's funny because I've seen that many times. I've seen I've seen actually some stories where they show Neil Armstrong dealing with people that come and say, "Oh, why did you lie? You never win," and, you know. And he, oh. he's wound up getting in uh, fist fights with people more than once over that kind of crap. He uh, is really gets awful upset with these conspiracy theorists that want to say that he's never been there and it was all just an act. But yeah, it would be hard to be that. But that's basically what this. Abraham guy is. I mean, we have no idea really in the end whether he was or wasn't. Was the helmet just a bunch of crap? Was it a child's toy or was it a real helmet that he wore with his real spacesuit when he went on his real mission to Mars? Uh, if there's anybody out there who thinks that it was a child's plaything, stop listening. Don't don't listen to the show anymore. You, you are <laughs> you are heartless bastards. <laughs> but yeah, you never know. And that's the other thing too is you know history. They talk about that often. History is written by the victors, mm. and in this case, obviously China was the victor. There was no United States anymore. And whatever great accomplishments they have, they can easily just write. Oh no, that was you know. That, that was something that they faked. It was a mock-up. What's a mock-up? <laughs> You're mocking me, aren't you? You know, I, the younger generation may feel completely differently than we do. I, I, I don't know, but it's possible that there's not the love for space and rockets and all that stuff that... I don't know. You know, the thing is, I think the thing that really keeps the love for that kind of stuff going is the endless amounts of science fiction uh, that is out there, especially science fiction films, which are probably the things that are experienced the most, or maybe science fiction video games nowadays. All that space invaders that kids are playing. You know, those kind of things like you and I, we saw Star Wars and we wanted to be Han Solo. We wanted to be able to fly the Millennium Falcon and stuff. I think it's the same kind of a thing today. Kids still dream of that kind of stuff. And it's because of speculative fiction podcasts like our own. Sorry, no, it's because of speculative fiction and people dreaming up stories that keep people interested in that kind of thing. I think that's what really keeps the torch going. And I've heard hundreds of times stories about people who grew up as Star Trek fans or something like that and wanted to make the things that existed in Star Trek real. And so they invented a phone that can do all the crap that a tricorder could do, or a lot of the crap anyway, some of the crap. Or a green Orion slave girl. Yes. I think they're still working on that right now. Yeah, but I'm sure they'll get there. That's the kind of things that uh, keep people moving and going forward and tr dreaming is dreamers supplying them with some dreams to, to work on. I don't know. It's a really cool thing about science fiction. One of those things that I love is you don't have to be a writer to like science fiction you can be a scientist you can be any old joe you can be anything you know and you can have a dream and work towards it and make it a reality a dream that will last <laughs> for as long as for as long as you live everyone sing with me <laughs> climb every mountain i don't know if i have much more to say about it um but yeah these kind of stories get me thinking and really uh they're really interesting well then thank you michael anthony for sending that our way and thank you amory lowe for producing for those who did the voices free sound project did the sound effects that's right free sound gave us music and sound effects and uh thank you for listening i th this is our remember how disney had their renaissance and, and this is the dune renaissance we we're doing <laughs> episodes it? again and <laughs> bigger and greater and losing more parsecs than ever it's just <laughs> there you it's go. kind of a magical time for us it really is hey one thing that i want to mention everyone already knows big everyone already knows oh okay well you have anything you want to mention then 
I'm almost afraid. To, I mean, how do I follow that? <laughs> Over at Marshall Latham's Journey Into Podcast, there's a special guest appearance that we got to do over there on his show. Well, it's not so much that we got to do it. We kind of forced Marshall to let us do it. Wait, wait. Well, that's not true. Oh, you're right. We were. He forced us to force him. <laughs> he was leading us on. Look at the shorts he was wearing, oh. Your Honor. Rich Outfield, you have been found guilty of all charges. So, yeah, he had us over there, and uh, we enjoyed ourselves an episode. We hosted the episode. You? Me? And the bottle makes three tonight. No. Y'all? It was you and me, and hey, we brought along Announcer Man, 080T with us. It was a good time. It was a big party up in... Burley, Idaho, or whatever the heck town it is he lives. I think he actually moved across the border to Oregon now. Somewhere out in I, the I sticks. believe he's out in Butlick, Ontario now. Oh, really? No. <laughs> yeah, it was so weird because he, I, I guess just for fun, he wanted us to come and take over the show. And so he told us what to say. And then he said, then just go do your thing. You know, set up. This is the episode that you're going to introduce and... It's an episode of Zero Hour, that short-lived radio show from the 70s that Rod Serling hosted, uh, and it guest stars Casey Kasem and William Shatner. And I, I, my guess is that he heard this episode and was like, wow, Casey Kasem and William Shatner. I'm going to call them Doom Steve boys. Yeah, To come do this episode. Wait, I, that, I, that's how I imagine Marshall talk. He's a Marshall, Marshall. so he probably sounds like that. The, to me, the, the hardest thing was... In my pants. Really? No. To me, the hardest thing was... I'm going he, home. He, I guess he starts every show with, and come with us now, and journey into... And then he has a word. Something that epitomizes what the story you're about to hear, what its theme is, what its classification is, what its genre is, Science. what its color... So, yes. Adventure. Disaster films. <laughs> Man, so every time we go anywhere, it's got to be something as offensive as possible today. Warning, today's show sucks. Listener discretion is advised. And, and so we listened to the whole episode of that radio play, and then we had to come up with a word for what it was a journey into. Journey into the unintelligible. I mean, the unimaginable. Is it because you have bad speakers or... <laughs> I'm sure it's partially that. Yeah, the speaker, one of my speakers has been blown on this computer for probably two years. So it just turns to fuzz. But yeah, it was difficult. The whole show is basically takes place like over radios, like from Houston calling up to the space station and back. So it's all like, <laughs> oh, Houston, come in, Houston. <laughs> So there was a fair amount of dialogue that was lost in that stuff that was going on. But, uh, you know, it's a radio drama. So, you know, you got to make it realistic-ish. So hopefully, if you enjoy our show, you will enjoy our Hosting. hostile takeover of <laughs> Journey Into. Yeah, go over and check it out. If you can't get enough Dune Steve, just listening to the Dune Steve, where well, you can get an extra helping. A heapin' helping. A heapin' helping of our hospitality yes over at journey into dot blogspot.com that's right go check it out you know you keep saying this crazy word what what crazy would donate no no oh. this 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 dune steve word oh oh and you know you know it never even occurred to me before but it's it's a funny word i guess it is kind i of... don't know what it means or where it comes from it, it, would you mind just filling i mean maybe there's somebody out there that wonders the same as me well there's this hat okay it's made in the islands off of new zealand it looks kind of like those conical chinese hats that you see in the movies but it's made out of leather okay bat leather it takes the wings of a dozen large bats to make one dune steve of course the best most expensive dune steves are made with tiny stitches from hundreds of baby bat wings 
That's really, really upsetting to me, Matt. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. You know, I actually knew a guy once who had one of these Dune Steve hats. Dalton James, maybe? Yeah, maybe. Um, it was a cool hat. I, I don't know that I've ever seen a cooler hat. So obviously when it came time to name the podcast, that, yeah, that, I went straight for that. Obviously. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. The other thing is one of our listeners... Jen Gambell. Now, I think it's Gambell. I knew a guy named Gambell. His last name was that in high school, so I'm going to pronounce it the same as him. Can it just be Gamble? It could be, but I'm going to say Gambell because I knew a guy in high school. I knew who, no guys in high school, anyway. so I'm going to say Gamble. Okay, you say Gamble and I'll say Gambell. That way, one way or another, we got it right. <laughs> Jen Gambell is a listener of our show, and she also is a cross-stitcher. A black belt in cross stitch. A a black belt in cross stitch. (laughs) That ain't Uh, funny, man. And uh, yeah, she wanted to donate to the podcast in her own special way. And so she decided to do Doonstief related cross stitches. And she said, you know, you can offer these up to folk and these folk can donate to the show and earn themselves a special Doonstief related cross stitch. So... We got our first cross stitch in from her, and it's so cool. Maybe I just love it because of what it is, and I have a special place in my heart. But it's a cross stitch version of a Charlotte's Web type cover, except for in in this case, it's done up to be Asshat Magic Spider cover instead. And it's got a rocket ship, and it's got little spider webs around the side. And it says, by Scott Westerfeld at the bottom. And on top of that, she framed it. A frame with actual glass, so it's fancy. Glass? Who gives a shit about glass? <laughs> and so yes, there's going to be a picture that so you can see what we're talking about. If you would like this, donate to the show. Do we want to make a, a level? Whoever donates this much first wins? I don't know. You, you paid for asshat out of your own pocket so i don't feel like i should be talking about if you're trying to recoup some of the costs (laughs) of that was that the last episode you produced no i did the question and that's been since then and a few others i'm not sure what else liar i don't remember we could go down our list no we'll say the first person to donate 40 bucks Oh, forty dollars is enough to get us to go see Battleship. Come on, there you go. It's also enough to earn yourself a framed cross stitch of Asset Magic Spider. So if you donate forty bucks, the first person to do so gets this cross stitch. We'll mail it out to you and everything. The second person to donate that gets our Parsec nomination. <laughs> There you go, which in other words, you get some bump kiss. No, no, no. They've got to get something, right? <laughs> okay. If you, if you donate, but you're not first, there are other cross stitches coming. Jen said she's already started a couple of others. Also, Big has a child that interrupts our recording session every like 15 to 20 minutes. <laughs> so yeah, you can have your pick of whatever comes next if you are not the first. I believe she started in on a, a cool little Doonstief logo. And uh, all the cool monsters at once. I think she's going to do a a cross stitch of. We should just send all of these to Mike Resnick because he's my grandpa. You guys wondered how we got him to do these episodes. (laughs) So, yeah, if if you're interested in that, donate and we'll send it along because, I don't know, I think they're pretty darn cool. If nobody donates, then the cool thing is I get to keep it. But I don't want nobody to donate because that would be sad. All right, I guess that's it for us, uh, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Oh, and, and uh, when, if you get a chance, thank the Hulk. Oh, yes. Would you? Yes, I will. All right. I've been Rich Outfield. And I'm McGanklevich. See you later, folks. Why not? That brings us to the end of the show. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it. Take two. Climb every mountain. Follow every byway until you find your dream. Traitor child, I must despise you now. Oh, saved that up just for you. Gross. Welcome to the show.